Hi everyone, we have with us science historian Janavi Falke, who has won the Infosys Science Prize Award for 2023 in Humanities for her work into history of science into India, the institutions in India and archival work when it comes to research and how science developed in the country. She's also an author of the book, The Atomic State, that was printed back in 2013. And she has written a lot and she runs the Science Gallery Bengaluru. Hi, Janvi. Welcome. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Sandhya. Thank you. And thank you for your kind words. Of course. So um, let's just quickly get into it. I thought we can start off with asking you a little bit about uh, your work, your background and how long you've been working in history of science and in museums. OK, so um, it's almost 23 years now since I have been doing history of science. It feels a lot, my God. Um, so, yeah, you know, over two decades now. Uh, but I did come to it serendipitously. So uh, my first three degrees, in fact, because, you know, one can't have enough degrees, uh, were in civics and politics. So um, I studied in Bombay and then at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies where I studied civics and politics, politics of Asia and Africa. And um, it was then when I started on the PhD program in what one might broadly call political sociology, um, I found myself not very happy with what I was doing and, you know, the kind of questions that were generally, um, one might say, occupying the minds of, of, you know, people who were studying and te teaching me um, studying with me, teaching me, et cetera. And so I took a call to just check out what else I could do. And uh, I got admitted with full funding to the Georgia Tech History of Science program. And today, I think after 23 years, it would be fair to be honest and say I had no idea of what it is that I was walking into. But pretty much, I think, Within the first six months, um, it was it was just it just blew my mind. I mean, really, really blew my mind. I went and took um, undergraduate courses in physics. I went and saw you know uh, facilities in sort of you know big science research, particle physics research, on the Georgia Tech campus, and uh, it was uh, it was like nothing I had seen before. And I think what sort of surprises me still. Um, and makes me really happy is that uh, I still am fascinated in a similar way by things I do in history of science, right? Like, so I first studied the beginnings of experimental nuclear physics in India, which is, you know, um, upon which my book Atomic State is based, uh, after which I did a little bit of work in the history of aerodynamics and then in the history of statistics more recently, which is hopefully going to be the next, um, you know, major project at least. Um, and with every project, I've kind of found renewed joy, renewed you know, engagement and, you know, just, just going to the archive, finding new things. And it's like, oh my God, what were they thinking? Oh my God, like, is did this really happen? And I think that sustains um, my, sustains me, you know, because I mean, I, I, I am kind of, uh, as my family doesn't fail to remind me all the time, I am a workaholic. Um, and work doesn't just mean reading, writing. And I, you know, as, as you asked me about the gallery, um, that has kind of given a different turn to my professional life, um, a different understanding on, on um, you know, the public life of research and what research might even mean, what, you know, uh, how do I bring my insights from history of science into doing the new work, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a quite an exhilarating journey. And of course, there have been frustrating moments when the archives were missing and, you know, um, or I didn't sort of get the right kind of, documents or I didn't couldn't meet the right people so of course it's ups and downs but the joy is is still there and and you know the the drive is still there that's so lovely to hear and you are also an expert of um, the history of nuclear science research in India and you have applied this in the post-colonial context which is one of the things that your work has been recognized for can you tell us a little bit about what aspects of your work um, has been picked up by the Infosys Science Foundation and has been given recognition? Thank you. So, um, you know, the history of nuclear physics in India, like elsewhere in the world, is a is a complex mix of um, science, politics, um, and the state, 
right? Like uh, with the Manhattan Project and, you know, as, as um, you know, it, it's an opportune moment in a sense because we've all more or less in the public domain seen Oppenheimer. So we understand the complexity, the intensity and the scale of that project. And, and what that meant for particle physics after the Second World War is what we saw being played out in India as well. And the scale changed completely. The nuclear physics was no longer possible you know, in the university setting because it had just become so massive and so expensive. And what is very interesting, and for a historian, a rare opportunity, is that the Indian state was being formed at the exact same time. So 45, 47, right? Like there's a two-year period within which the Indian state, in a way, comes into being uh, of, of uh, uh, free India. And therefore, then, the need to organize research that is deeply embedded into what makes for a sovereign state got completely implicated with nuclear physics research right and it's a it's it's a it's a moment that doesn't kind of you know doesn't play out for uh, in a similar manner for other disciplines like molecular biology is incredibly powerful today you know uh, starting of course in a few decades ago but that moment was just not there right like in 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 and and there's nothing wrong with it but because in history you know you you don't get I mean, moments don't come to order convergence happens when it does right and therefore what it did is it altered the understanding of how, sta how the state was supposed to support and organize research. And through it became refracted, the Indian state's approach also to other kinds of research, not just particle physics and nuclear physics. And so I think that what I, and, and the, to, the, to the question that you asked me, you know, what is it about the research that might have actually um, appealed to the jury um, is that, you know, there was no way to separate the registers anymore. You couldn't separate politics from institutional history, from individual ambitions, from the state. And usually you can say, oh, in this context, in that context. But here the context was so intricately sort of woven together that there was no way to separate out. This is what knowledge making is. This is what politics making is. This is what state making is. Right? And this is for nuclear physics. This is for nuclear physics. Right. That yeah. Time. It's also a matter of national security. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so this is a, this is a very important dual use technology, which kind of just embeds itself like a you know almost like a DNA edit, right, into the making of the Indian state. And I think that's what makes it interesting to me, of course, when I when I when I've been writing it, but also I think what it allowed me to do simply because of the kind of case it was, is to write a history without kind of narrowing down in any manner, right? Like, so it wasn't the history of a lab, the history of a person or persons, or the history of the Indian state's quest to organize nuclear research, because they were not separate from each other. And in able to, uh, in being able to show that, I think that history becomes that much richer. And I think it's a big frame history in that sense, because the lab is not missing, nor are the individuals, nor is the state. Right. And I think though, because it's become increasingly harder to write those kinds of histories, just given the trends in history writing, right, like we become narrower and narrower and narrower. And, you know, we answer sort of more, more and more, more and more focused questions. And here, because of the kind of history it is, it allowed me to kind of answer, a, a, you know, a answer a sort of precise questions about question about the beginnings of experimental nuclear physics in India. But at the same time, credibly speak about the state, about politics, about, you know, or the organization of research on the national scale. So I think that probably that that complexity hmm. um, was hmm. kind of, you know, uh, one could, I mean, I could do that work. And I think I, I suspect that is what the jury has found interesting. And I'm, I'm grateful that they have found it interesting. That's uh, that's really, uh, I also find that quite interesting. And one of the other things that I'm curious about is that, when we talk to, say, physicists or computer engineers, um, you can sort of clearly see the result of their work and you can talk about how it can be applied to, say, even technology in the future. Uh, could you tell us how your findings can be applied in the future? What are some things that we can learn from history of science uh, when it comes to application of new tech in the future? Hmm. Very good question. And very difficult to answer, right? Like, so I've, I've often quoted my dear friend and colleague, Srinath Raghavan, on this, where he says, um, 
uh, also a, an Infosys laureate from a few years ago, uh, who said that, you know, history doesn't offer lessons, but historians can offer insights, right? And which can then inform sort of future uh, activities or policy or things like that. And I think what one can, speaking specifically to the history of experimental nuclear physics, I think the, the insights that one can draw from there are one of how, um, you know, speaking back to just uh, what I was just explaining earlier, um, is that, you know, the lab is not functioning in a universe that is separate from everything outside it. So I think that insight that science is a social enterprise, science is a political enterprise, and that it is in no way separate to anything that outside that happens outside the walls of institutions or, or walls of the laboratory. And, and it's not a new insight at all, right? Like Because we've been working with this insight since um, Bruno Latour's book, Science in Action, right? Or Laboratory Life, which he wrote with Steve Bulgar. So I think that insight is very important in order to contextualize knowledge making, funding for science, and how one might actually organize ambitions in, in a context where, you know, whether we like it or not, still, we are a resource scarce country, right? Like, it, it's not it's not that we have infinite sort of resources. We are in a much better situation than even when I was growing up. There is more funding now. There is more, you know, uh, there are more people who are well-trained, but it's still a resource country. There is still a resource crunch, right? So I think the, the kind of insights one can draw are about how state priorities reorganize research completely. What does that mean for universities? What does it mean to take research outside of uh, the university into national labs and other locations, right? Like national facilities. What that means is that you starve university departments of research funding to the point where then they are no longer in a situation to be able to take advantage of any new research that comes in because they simply don't have the wherewithal to actually latch on to it, right? Like in, in India, we see this again and again, the universities are severely underfunded. And that started out with good reasons, but was never course corrected, right? Like it, at the door, at, at sort of at independence, there were, there were less resources. Uh, research had to be organized in a particular way. The state was, you know, the statist ambitions, statist reason were very important. But that never got course corrected. So you know, the universities never came to the forefront of organizing research or contributing to research, and that has its that has consequences. That has costs, right? I mean, in, in any other country, if you had a university that gave the country two Nobel laureates, right? Like, and I'm talking about the University of Madras now. Chandrasekhar Venkatraman and Subramanian Chandrasekhar both had something or the other to do with the University of Madras. We don't. You know, one, we don't really know. Two, there is no commemoration. And there is nothing that that university, in a way, one doesn't see that story being played out, right? Like, no more resources have gone to the university. No more nurturing has gone to the university. They haven't claimed it with pride. So, in a way, what it does is it, it, it I mean, yeah, you you kind of get distant from your own histories, right? Like, so, so one has to know these histories. One also, in a way, has to take those insights and to see, you know, where is course correction necessary? Where can one kind of, you know, bring um, the highlight on processes of knowledge making, what goes into them, and therefore, how might one do it today, right? Like, so, and of course, it is always context dependent, always, always context dependent, and we all know that. Yes, indeed. And uh, what you just explained sort of shows why your award is in humanities. You know, we always have these this debate between science and humanities and should science students study humanities. And it's not just sociology and other things that we typically think of when we think of humanities. It's also the history of science and the role that people played in the development of science and research. That was really interesting. I would say that uh, probably my last question to you is what is next for you over the next say, five to 10 years, apart from your extremely interesting science gallery stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, you know, as you as you can see, I have an almost bifurcated past in the last six years with, with work with the science gallery, as, I, as I've said repeatedly to anyone who is willing to listen. Um, you know, I, I've been a construction supervisor, I've been an audit supervisor, I've been an HR person, you know, all of those things that I, I, I did not ever kind of think that I would be doing. But I still have, of course, brought insights from the history of science into the making of the gallery, you know, um, like thinking about Raman's lab, for example, which was a public lab, right? 
And so those ideas inform my work at the gallery, but that's not your question. Your question is, what am I going to do with my life if it's not only the gallery? And I think, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to say that on the 19th uh, of January, we are throwing our doors open to the public. So it's a, it's a big moment also for me. Um, and the fact that, you know, again, as a historian, you think of sort of convergences. So the fact that it, the award comes so close to the gallery opening uh, is a beautiful moment for me and, I, and one that I'm very, very deeply humbled by, but also appreciate um, because what it allows me to now dream of is, okay, what next, right? And I, I, there are, there are, there are a couple of plans. Right? So I have a book that I've been uh, mildly editing for the, for the last several years on government and science in India. And I hope to send it off to the publishers very, very soon. Like, like, you know, in, in a matter of weeks rather than months, so we will have this edited manuscript on government and science, which was written in the 1960s, which takes sort of stock of, uh, you know, what what bureaucracy and bureaucratic procedure has done to Indian science and how, you know, in many ways in Indian, uh, the conduct of Indian science has become procedural. And it's very scary that, you know, a book from the 1960s should resonate so strongly even, you know, for, for, the, la for the later decades. And we're not talking about the last 10 years or 15 years, we're talking about the entire 75 year period after independence so it's it's very very scary so there's there's that book after which i'm hoping to kind of return with full energy to the history of statistics because that's the project you know um had i not written about the beginnings of experimental nuclear physics i would have written about um, d2 which is mahalanobis distance and it was a method for sampling that uh, prashanta mahalanobis came up with in the 1930s um it is um you know, so so just to give give it context. So in the 30s and 40s, when you know two major countries, which were at that point peers, and now one doesn't know if they're quite peers, is China and India. And the Chinese went for a 100% census statistical model. And Arunab Ghosh has written a fabulous book about it. Um, um, the Indians went for the sampling method. So you know, so instead of so in order to derive statistics, which is basically political arithmetic, right? Like state is data. In order to arrive at useful data about the new country that had taken birth, um, in, in India, we went for the sampling method. And so how do you measure the distance between a sample and its distribution? And that was the method that uh, Malanobis came up with. And, and it, it was, you know, it, at that point, sort of bleeding edge or cutting edge, however one wants, wants to call it. And he his work is placed in a long history of, of developing methods in sampling, but also developing different and new methods in statistics. Indian statistics and statisticians at that point were on the world stage. They were training people um, for the United Nations and elsewhere in order to set up their own statistical systems in their countries. So sort of fairly, you know, fairly sort of world-class, but also leading research was happening in India at that point of time. And uh, the book that I wish to write, um, for which I have been doing research for a few years, but just, yeah. So is is a biography of that method. So where did it come from in a way and where has it gone? So, so there, there's a very, very, um, how should I say, topical story that can be told. Um, and I'm hoping that I'll find the energy to return to it and, uh, you know, uh, and begin my second innings. That sounds extremely exciting. So I suppose you'd be spending a lot of time at ISI as well. Yep. Yeah, that Absolutely. sounds wonderful. I'm really looking forward to seeing your next book as well. And all of your, uh, the opening of Science Gallery Bengaluru, which I believe is in Bellary Road, the office. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just, yeah. Uh, yeah, just after Makri Circle in Bangalore. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. All the very best. And congratulations again for this award. Thank you so much for joining us and for enlightening our viewers about your work. And uh, best of luck. Hope to have you again soon. Thank you so much, Sandhya. Thank you for the opportunity to, you know. Thanks a lot, Jandi.